I want you to imagine that you're walking down a street and a stranger comes up to you and he says, close your eyes. I'm going to put something in your mouth. <laughs> you're laughing, but you did that this morning. And you'll do that when you go to the grocery store tomorrow or the next day. Because we have a totally opaque food system. We are buying food of unknown origin from people that we will never meet. It's an opaque food system that we can't really fix if we don't even know how to have the conversation. We don't even know how to ask the questions of the people that are producing our food. All of that, ironically, begins with words. You can't have a conversation, as you know, if you don't know the words. So what my partner and I did five years ago is we said, what would it take to make a more transparent food system? How could we make consumers more informed and producers more capable of sharing all the amazing things they're doing with consumers so we could actually have a system that's more equitable and we could actually fix our crappy food system? To start, probably, you'd want to begin with the most challenging of words, which is sustainability. A word so important, and ironically, a word that means absolutely nothing. You can buy sustainable tennis shoes. You can buy sustainable soda, sustainable toothpaste, because it doesn't mean anything. So we thought, what would happen if we tried to take the meaning of that word back? So for five years, we went around the United States asking people to explain to us what sustainability was. What was the language that they used, the terms that were most vital to express a pretty fundamental concept that has been stolen from us and that we want to take back? Running Squirrel, a Native American forager. I asked him what sustainability was. He couldn't pronounce it. He told me he didn't know what it was. But then he and I went foraging together. And I said, tell me, how did, how did you learn to discern what plants to eat, what plants to leave? And he said, I learned from my grandmother, from my great aunt. You never eat all of anything. You observe the animals. You see what they eat, and you can probably eat as well. And then you watch how they eat. They never eat all of everything. They always leave just a little bit behind so it will seed. So when they come back the next year, they'll find something. A farmer in Northern California, eight generations. I ask her what sustainability is, she doesn't bat an eye. She says it's survivability. If we're not here, if we can't survive how difficult it is to maintain production in a world that has gone totally industrial, it doesn't really matter. So for her, it was very pragmatic. How is she going to hold on to this farm for another generation? Olympia, Washington. Low-income communities with no access to good food. They could bemoan their existence. They could complain that it's just the way that it is. Whereas they've done here with a group called Grub, you could build 250 gardens in people's backyards so they could actually have more food security in their community. Will Allen in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, had a crazy idea. Low-income communities, if they could actually grow their own protein, would be more secure. And even more crazy, they could raise fish in buildings, in boxes. I wanted to find a way to capture that visually. I'm a filmmaker. We tell stories that have beginnings and middle and ends. Photographs are problematic for me because they're a moment in time. And not only that, if I was going to take a photograph of this room, it wouldn't take one, it would take 50, because my eyes see as wide as the space, but my camera only gives me this. So it's a challenge, especially when it's somebody like Will Allen, who's such an amazing guy. Because not only is Will Allen growing fish inside of warehouses, but he's also taking that water that runs out of those tanks in those boxes that you see on the right, and he's raising produce. And he's also growing worms as, as he composts all of the, the food scraps from his community. It's a system that's so amazing 
that actually next week in Milwaukee, there'll be 5,000 people from all over the country that are gathering there that are acolytes of this system, who aren't waiting for the USDA or the FDA to fix their food system. They're not looking for a handout. They just want the tools and the information. But how can I tell Will's story? I can't do it with a single picture. It's a problem. So what I did was, I thought about what you do as a filmmaker, how you try to think of the totality of a story from the beginning to the middle to the end. And so I took not one, but many pictures. And I tried to capture the essence that could explain what Will was doing. There's a famous phrase in English, but actually it turns out it's in many languages, universal perhaps, that a picture is a thousand words. It's not true. How often do you look at a picture and find your eyes going down to the caption because you have a question about what you're looking at that isn't answered by the picture itself? Pictures lead to questions. But how do we resolve that problem that we create when we present somebody with an image, especially something as complex as this? I thought to get people to explain their own experiences in their own words. I thought, what if actually Will explained to me what aquaponics was, or produce, or what vermiculture is, in his own words? And what if I could actually help you to understand the action that's happening in the picture, the beginning and the middle and the end that we lose in traditional photography? What if I could, of course, give you their names, and also maybe give you a sense of where this is happening? And of course, let's not forget the fish. Lastly, what is the definition? What is the principle that defines what Will does? What is he trying to tell us? Well, as Will will tell you if he was here, it's nothing short of a, than a good food revolution. He is trying to change the way people in low-income communities get access to food. So of course, he would actually write that and give you his definition at the bottom of the picture. And then lastly, to give you context, to wrap it up with a bow, I might tell you a little bit about the story of Will Allen. What you're looking at, ironically, is how any newspaper presents information. Has a headline, has a teaser text, has body copy, might give you the date line of where it's happening. This is how we know how to process information. But it's done graphically. We continued our journey around the United States, looking at all kinds of theories and principles that could give you a window into the principles and practices of sustainability. It was a journey that was a long one. Each of these images, as you've seen here, is a photo collage. The actual size could be 12 feet by 6 feet tall. It could take a month to do a single one, because every single image is an image that's actually in their own words. And as any of you know, working with people, it's very, very hard to, to actually get people compressed down when they have something so important to say. But the end of that journey was an amazing one. We didn't know when we started. We were fairly naive. But we realized about two or three years in that we were building a crowdsourced, peer-reviewed taxonomy of all of the key terms and principles you would need if you wanted to talk about sustainability in food and farming. Crowdsourced because people all over the country began sending us ideas of who we should be documenting. Crowdsourced because wherever I went, people would take me by the hand, in a few cases even taking the note I had of all the people I wanted to photograph and crumpling it up and throwing it away and say, I know instead who you're going to be taking pictures of. You're from California. You guys like to take pictures of organic tomatoes. Forget that. And peer reviewed, because wherever we went, we would then compare the terms and ideas we learned and share it with the next person. And they would help us to get a, a deeper understanding. Often ending up with a multiplicity of definitions, because this is an emerging language. There's no single idea or principle that defines any of these uh, core principles. But what we came up with was, and uh, really, uh, through a lot of incredible collaboration with so many people, hundreds of people across the country, was actually a taxonomy, a lexicon 
of sustainability. What always happens at this point is that somebody says, they're only words. Let's be real about that. What can words do? Well, you know, there's a lot of power that comes from learning a language. There's a lot of power that comes from being able to impart knowledge in a very, very compact way to somebody that says so much more than would be necessary if you had to explain an entire idea. The unpacking is always a great limiting factor for people who don't have the time and the desire unless you give it to them in a very, very simple way. Words have power. I can give you two very simple examples of how words can actually shift a food system. Monsanto, the company that cannot be named, introduced a growth hormone into the dairy industry. From one vector, you could say, tremendously successful. It, it made much higher output of milk from cows, but also a great health detriment to these animals. And one dairyman decided to put on a carton of milk, no RBST in my milk. He got sued by Monsanto. Not for what was in his milk, but for what, what wasn't in the milk. Because this dairyman thought, you know what? People might want to know what's in their food. They might want to know that they're actually drinking a milk that was generated by hormones. Monsanto lost that case, actually eventually ended up selling that part of their business. And what's amazing about it was consumers learned what RBST was and said, you know what, I probably don't want that. And they shifted the way an industry functioned. I remember the first time I heard about the term cage-free, I had no idea what it meant, but it I don't, sounded like a good concept. I mean, a chicken that wasn't in a cage making an egg, I had no idea if it would taste better, but it sounded good. Turns out I wasn't alone. Across the country, people said, oh, chickens are in cages? Well, wow, I probably don't want to buy something that came from a chicken in a cage. I want that egg from a chicken not in a cage. And they shifted an entire industry. And what's amazing is we can prove time and time again that when confronted by a totally opaque food system, when consumers are given the tools, when they are allowed to shop according to their values, the system changes. We just saw this film, True Cost Accounting, super wonky term. And yet, across the country, you will begin to see this term appear in 2015. Because more and more people are realizing that there is a very real cost to cheap food. And when people ask me for an explanation of that, I always give them one explanation. I always say, external costs are the things that you aren't paying for. It's why food is artificially cheap. And Alexander Hamilton created the country's first industrial park, actually just across the river here, on the Passaic River in New Jersey. It's where the first Colt pistols came from, our first industrial looms, it's our first locomotives were all manufactured because they harnessed the energy of that river for tremendous economic benefit. But where did all the waste go? It went back into that very same river. So and it's no mystery, obviously, 200 years later, that this became one of the EPA's first Superfund sites. We can kick the can down the road, but at some point, the can stops rolling. And those are external costs. And as consumers, it's no mystery that we have the cheapest food in the industrial world, and we also have the highest healthcare costs. They're totally connected. These are the real costs of cheap food. Also, there's other costs involved. The cost of actually making good, clean food is hard. And cattlemen will always tell you about the cow to pickup truck index. And what that means is that in 1985, you could buy a pickup for 3,800 bucks. You could sell a cow for 480 bucks at slaughter. In, 19, in 2012, that same pickup had gone from 3,800 to $51,000. And that cow had only gone from $480 to $840. The sheer economics of actually trying to grow clean food when you are playing against an industrial system are a fool's errand because the odds are stacked up against you. 
unless consumers can understand the values behind each of those practices and can shop and vote accordingly when they buy food and support the systems of agricultural production that are more in line with their values. This power of values is key because if consumers aren't educated, they can't transform our food system. So our project talks about organic and even beyond organic. Going through the South, I was confronted time and time again by farmers who told me that they were not organic, that they, um, that they actually uh, answer to a, a much different set of criteria. And they use the principle of local first, certification second. Our previous speaker talked about trust. In the South, people don't believe in an FDA organic certification, but they'll tell you that they believe in face certification, of actually knowing where their food comes from. The same with GMOs. The non-GMO movement, and for those of you who don't know, GMO stands for genetically modified organism, an organism that would not exist in nature, that was created and in most cases patented by companies that then control the seeds and charge you accordingly. With uh, health and environmental consequences not fully understood. So because of this not understanding, consumers would like to know actually if this is in their food. Because believe it or not, you have no regulation that would actually stipulate you'd have to ha actually put this on a package at this point. And so there's a non-GMO movement of people wanting more transparency in their food system. And for those of you who don't know, 2018, Whole Foods has decreed that anything in their store will have to say whether it's GMO or non-GMO. But at the same time, it's a very simplistic argument to argue against GMOs. The case being that in Hawaii, for example, GMO papaya was introduced 20 years ago, saved an entire industry from collapse. Seeds were given away for free. Now thriving with uh, no environmental impact seen 20 years later. So even simplistic ideas also have more complexity the more you go into them. This idea of learning what these principles mean, because you actually do need to take responsibility for your food, comes with tremendous responsibility, and it never ends. This idea that you're going to constantly be forced to understand how your food system works. Antibiotics in meat. Traceability, the fact that if you actually are in this audience and you tell me that you had red snapper in the last 12 months, I would tell you you probably didn't. 75% of the red snapper in this country is, actually isn't red snapper, because there's no way to actually verify what fish are when you buy them either in a restaurant or at the supermarket. So there's a movement underway to actually have tags that actually when fish come out of the water, they're tagged, and that tag can follow it all the way to when it comes to the store. Traceability, antibiotics in, in meat, identity of food. These are all things that consumers are now demanding, not only in the United States, but across the world. Because they want to know where their food came from, and they want to know the values associated with it. Because we're at a conference that's about design, I thought I would talk a little bit about how our project works. I think design is important in the sense that it makes complex ideas simple. So much of what we do in our project is taking a super complicated idea and making it as simple and as aesthetically pleasing as possible, of taking complex things that you cannot see and making them visible and creating ways to explain even with maps. This is a group in Los Angeles that has mapped all of the f wild and, uh, 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 and publicly available fruit in the entire city. And this is, if you actually take this image and take the book and take this image, you can actually find an orange tree in the middle of Los Angeles where you can actually pick fruit. And even complex principles. Uh, this, this one explaining the economies of community. Or principles like food miles. The, our project is, is one that, because of our graphical approach, allows us to not only speak authentically by having people who are the greatest uh, thought leaders and greatest practitioners of a principle explain something in their own words, but then actually work with us to graphically explain how you would best present that, to leverage their knowledge. This is a watershed where water starts at the top of uh, this oldest watershed in the United States on the island of Kauai, how water starts at the top, how they split it 300 years ago. They split the river to give some to farm production, which in the case is taro, and then to give other, the, the, like the rest of it, to the mother ocean. 
to explain the importance of water um, to these Hawaiians, uh, principles that we can certainly learn from now. Lastly, I want to just touch on the portability of ideas. It wouldn't just be enough to make these images, to make pretty pictures, and then expect people to find them. We spend about 10% of our time finding these people and gathering their ideas, and about 90% of our time getting them out into the world. How do we do that? Well, we have a series of short films with PBS, of which you saw one. You can go to pbs.org, or you can go to our website to see the other 25 of them. Um, you can um, also check out our pop-up shows. We, instead of having one show that would travel around to museums across the country, we flipped it upside down. And we said, hang on, it doesn't make any sense. Why don't we print 100 shows and ask anybody across the country to say, I want to be a curator of your show. This is five places where I'm going to do it. And we go, great. We mail you the show. It's yours. You keep it. In 18 months, we've had almost 700 shows in the United States, all curated by people that I've never met, hundreds of curators with our shows. These are just a, a sampling of a few of them, and everything from Central Park to South Central Los Angeles to a, a slow money conference in San Francisco. We also have street art, where we, you can actually go to our website today, and you can download our, our images and turn them into wheat paste, have painting parties, and just put them up anywhere. And then lastly, we have a book that just came out. And we're soon to release our social uh, network that comes out in November, all exploring and bringing to larger audiences these ideas. Project Localize is our educational initiative. Not only do I make these images, but I now teach kids around the country how to create their own information artwork. We started in Iowa. We took 75 kids around the state in the heart of industrial agriculture to show them what alternatives to that system would look like. And then we showed them how to make information artworks like I have showed you today. And actually how to take pictures and become journalists and actually to map all these amazing ideas from these food practitioners. And then we took those images of what you see here. These are made by 16 and 17 year olds who had never used cameras or didn't even know what Photoshop was. We had to load it onto their computers. We took their work, and we took it to Washington, DC. And what we did was rented out the metro station underneath the USDA and turned it into a gallery, which forced the USDA to actually bring these kids to DC, where they presented on Capitol Hill to congressmen, to lawmakers who were writing our farm bill to the USDA and even on the steps of the Capitol Hill to congressmen. We gave these kids the power to actually learn a graphical process that could activate them, that could then turn them into activists in their communities. And they're now teaching the next generation of kids. We're now doing this in high schools across the country. So I would just leave you with this. Your words can actually change the world. And all we ask you to do is to use those words wisely and to think of yourself as disseminators of important ideas because communication of vital ideas is what shifts the food system, but also shifts the way that we look at each other and our society. Thank you very much. Have a seat. Um, you mentioned the open source gallery project. Uh, tell people how they could do be a curator if they wanted to be. You go to uh, lexiconofsustainability.com, and you just go to the board says curator, and you just download it. And uh, it's a super fast process. And, and what are the qu criteria? That you have to agree to do five shows in a community, and that you have to agree to be a lending library if anybody wants to borrow it. And it's not so bad. I have to say, and if you go there, you'll see hundreds of curators and too many shows to list. So we only have a, I think 500 up, yeah. up, like up there. But it, uh, it, to me, it was, a, it was a tremendous proof that all people want are the tools. 
They're not, any, they're not waiting around for anybody to fix things for them. They just want the tools, and they're going to go out and do it themselves. Yeah. Well, and speaking of the tools, uh, you mentioned traceability. And it was right here. I looked it up because I remembered it. Uh, in 2008, right here in Manhattan, two, I believe they were high school students, Kate Steckel and Louisa Strauss, went around and collected fish samples from restaurants and then DNA typed them because they had access to a low-cost DNA um, coder. And what they found, <laughs> what they found was that a quarter of all of the fish at restaurants in Manhattan were not that fish that you were getting, and especially if it was sushi, especially if it was raw yeah. fish. Um, do we have to, is this where we're at? Like we have to do this now? Well, you know, unfortunately we do because there is no really, account, there is no accountability with how our food system works. So unless con consumers demand certain things happen, nothing will happen. We have a, a USDA that is not an active agent of change. And I would argue that they're not even the greatest offender of um, ensuring that we have healthy and safe uh, food. So it's really incumbent upon us as individuals to become informed and to become activated and make those choices that are aligned with our values. And that's actually how you do change things. Well, so right before this, we had Jerry talking about trust. But here's an example where you can't necessarily trust the fish you're getting in a sushi restaurant here. Well, or yeah, so, right? so like the flip side of that is, however, you can, you can put your faith in people who, um, I mean, one of the greatest challenges we have is that uh, when, when people talk about food systems, they say, well, you know, I would like to eat more locally. I'd like to be more connected to my local food system. But you can't get everything local. So for those things you can't get local, whether it's salmon or coffee or any of those other things. Coffee and spices. To, yeah, there has to be a Big system. Deal where you can actually make purchases that are aligned with your values, mm -hmm. even for the things you can't see. In our book, what we talk about is the connected market. That you could, uh, how can we apply those values for the things that we get locally to the things that come from halfway around the yeah. planet? Nice, and chocolate. Any chocolate fans, you're not getting it locally. Um, uh, we have a great question here from Twitter. Uh, have you thought about creating this kind of lexicon for other areas of social concern? So we never talk about it, but um, our project is actually a project about climate change. We don't talk about it because we, uh, we feel like we need to get to the point where we can change the way people talk about climate. Because there, there is climate burnout. There's climate fatigue in this country. So our project started looking at food and farming. We're now in the middle of making images and it films about water. And that will take us for the next 18 months. And then we're doing the same thing with energy. Building this peer-reviewed and crowdsourced taxonomy of terms, figuring out the most important ones to express with images and films, and then moving on from one. And ultimately, in three or four years, we will be able to look at climate change collectively with all of these ideas. Nice. You have a nice long-term strategy there. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about the lexicon? What, I know you showed like a, a quick slide of it, but um, what does it mean to have a social network of words? Well, uh, in November, we spent the last year um, building on the Drupal platform a social network where people will be able to actually build their own communities and conversations around these ideas. And so from the very beginning, that was always our design, that you know, where, would, where would all these ideas live in a way that they could be dynamic and people could, could continue to add to them. So our social network, which, which launches in November, will be a really valuable way to do that. And that will be the lexicon.org. Right. And this is really why it's called a lexicon of sustainability. You're essentially, and that's why I call this sort of a next generation conversation in general, next generation Wikipedia. Imagine an image like, it's too bad we don't have more of his images up on, on screen right now. Imagine an image of a term like you've seen, like Douglas Creates, being the starting point for a conversation uh, and a long-term conversation with examples and videos and comments and other kinds of media attached to it. That, that's a pretty exciting um, uh, proposal to me. Mm -hmm. In think, November? Yeah, November. Okay. Yeah. We have another question. Uh, when you have uh, these curated art shows that others do, do you sell the pieces to raise money? And if so, where do the funds go? Um, no, so our, our model is uh, an inverse economic model in, in that we give everything away for free. And we do that because we, we look at what we're doing as first a race to get ideas out into the world as fast as possible. And also because our system are, um, is built around bringing uh, revenue in in other ways. It's important for us to get ideas out of the world as fast as possible and to help people share them. There are cases where we've even got on airplanes to help our curators. Like there's one curator in uh, Georgia, uh, in Decatur, Georgia, that's done 40 shows since oh April. God, right. And I had to actually go and see it because I couldn't believe it. And I ended up doing fundraisers for her to help her 
with all of her team, you know, to help them nice. you know, to do to continue to do shows. So we're very involved with our curators. It's 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 really amazing and powerful, and mainly it proves to us really that um, there's a tremendous energy of people that is not being catalyzed around these ideas because they don't know how to be involved. If any of you have ever been in any of the Google cafeterias, they have all been redesigned around uh, Douglas's images, by the way. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you had told me five years ago that we would take pristine, at the time we considered them pristine artworks, and I would turn them into wallpaper and right. cut them up to fit around doors, yeah. I would have thought you, know, you were crazy. But again, as my wife, who runs Lexicon, told me, this is wallpaper. It's going to be there a while. And so we, are, we do installations all over the place. We're, we're very active. We're very, very active in that way. Right, exactly. Oh, well, good, we have some images. One last question. Uh, this is off Twitter again. How do we tackle the declining pollinator population alongside these other anti-industrial movements? Hashtag save the bees. So the question's about um, colony collapse disorder, I guess you would say, about uh, the problems that face bees. Um, um, and there are so many conflicting ideas about what causes colony collapse disorder. They often argue that since our almond groves in the Central Valley depend upon bees and they're moved and taken in trucks across the country every February and they're given a diet of sugar, that that leads to um, a, a degradation of those, of those colonies. There are all kinds of I ideas that, that people would claim are, that relate to GMOs that also further inhibit the, the strength and vitality of these populations. Sadly, we don't really, we, we don't really know uh, what causes colony collapse disorder. And, um, but since we do see it whenever there is an industrial agriculture, I think we can say that there might be a relationship and a connection there. And so what do we do about that relationship? Well, I, you know, I find it to be very, so our project is really, um, we try to be very, very careful about um, getting into um, um, pendulum swings. We try to say that there's colony collapse disorder, that the incidence of colony collapse disorder has dramatically increased with the advent of industrial agriculture, that there is probably a connection, that it is important to know that this exists, and that bees are important for us to have a, a safe and stable food supply. So we probably want to tackle the problem of colony collapse disorder if we want to continue to have food. And, uh, but we stop there. Okay. Uh, with that, let's thank Douglas, please.